So let's talk about how to get a mass spectrometer. Now, you might not really understand what a mass spectrometer does for now, but it will hopefully become clear as we go along. And basically think of it as a sort of analytical method. If I'll use a box. All right. Now, and to start with, let's put in our sample. And for simplicity, imagine our sample is an atom. Okay, are atoms charged? No. No, they are not. So if atoms are not charged, then can they be affected by electric and magnetic fields? No. No, they cannot. Now, as you probably gather, we're going to be relying on electric and magnetic fields, so this won't work, right? No. So we don't want that. So what do we need to do? What do we want? A, a charged particle. Right, so we're gonna, so, you know, we have to make it charged. You know, so either we start with it being charged or, or in this case, we're gonna ionize it. And so we're just gonna basically ionize it. And I'm just gonna ignore the details of this, yeah? But essentially we're gonna shoot electrons at it, right? Yeah. But I'm gonna ignore the details of that. So basically, Think of this as your sort of ionization chamber. Now, for details that I don't really want to get into too much, when we shoot electrons at it, it will take an electron and then a pair of electrons will kind of come out. Yeah. So there's a net loss of one electron. For the atom. Yeah. So if there's a net loss of one electron, what does the atom become? Become positive charged? Right. So at this point in time, after this ionization, we end up with a positively charged particle, which is probably an ion in my example here. But basically, more importantly for you, is that it's an ion. All right? Yeah. But uh, more importantly, is it's a positive charge. Okay. Well, if it's got a positive charge, is it moving right now? No. Not really. I mean, it, it probably is moving a little, you know, temperature not being zero and all that kind of thing. But the yeah. point is, it's not really moving in any particular direction. And if it's moving, it's probably not moving all that fast, right? It's random and all that. Oh, yeah. So we want to get it to move. And in my example, let's say I wanted to get it to move to the right. And yeah. so that's my aim here. How do I get this, what's now a positively charged particle to move to the right? You, you place a, a negative, negative plate. Yeah. yeah, basically use an electric field. Exactly. So we're now going to basically accelerate it. So this part of it, I'm going to leave out a lot of detail here. It's more important for you to sort of understand the, the, the purpose of each area rather than the specific details and design of it. But the point of this is to accelerate the particle. But you're right, that would involve again an electric field, which means we would put a negative plate here with a hole in the middle and you would actually also put a plate here so that basically it would repel it. And basically, you know, the purpose of this, there's other things as well, collimators and so on. The point is at the end of this, you've now got a positive charge that is moving at some velocity V. Yeah. Are you happy with that? Yeah. Okay. So, and now we've gone from something that's not charged, being an atom in my example, to something that is positively charged, to then something that is positively charged and moving. Yeah. Now, if it's positively charged and moving, do we know what the speed is 
like is it is it you know is are they all traveling at the same speed probably not probably not right so it, it will kind of depend like if we knew that all the masses were the same and so forth and then maybe yes but the point is we don't know that okay we don't know the masses are the same in which case they definitely aren't moving at the same speed all right yeah. and you might not understand why right now it will maybe become apparent as we kind of build up more and more but we don't want all the speeds we want to be able to control the speed yes yeah. Now, obviously, one way we can control the speed is change the change change the um, yeah. you know the electric field here, but yeah. but that that just makes you know instead of making everyone travel at the same speed, it just means the ones that were fast become slower, and the ones that were slower become even slower. You know, yeah. So that's not the point. We're not just trying to slow everyone down. We're just saying, you know, everyone needs to travel at fifty kilometers per hour, and if you're not, well, I don't want you, right? Yeah. So we need another section, and this section is basically your velocity selector. Basically, we control the velocity. All right. Now, this is I'm just just after now. I'm going to now. Do you have any questions for now? Oh no. All right, we're going to go into a bit of detail about how to control the velocity, all right? Yeah. Now, you probably don't need to know the full details of what I'm about to go to tell you, but you do need to understand that you need to control the velocity. Yeah. And, and by controlling velocity here, I mean anything too fast, anything too slow, we're getting rid of it. Yeah. Now, there's different ways to do it, um, but, you know, this is sort of one way. So, I want you to think about this. If I've got a positive charge going in, is there an electric field here? Um, yeah. Yes, there is. All right. Yeah. Now, what will the electric field do to the particle? It will repel and attract. So which way will it go? Um, yeah. So if you're a particle here, then you're going to get an electric field pushing you down, yeah? Yeah. You happy with that? Yeah. All right. And then hypothetically, let's say that I've got a magnetic field like so. And ignore the electric field. Ignore the electric field. What will the magnetic field do to this particle, if anything? Well, make it into circular motion. Um, so, so that's true for the magnetic field by itself, and you're right uh, about that. But, but uh, more fundamentally, how does an electric magnetic field affect a charged particle? The direction. Well, it, how does it affect the direction or anything? The uh, because the, it's experiencing a down force. Uh, it's experiencing a force exactly because it's experiencing a force. And that force, we can calculate the magnitude and so on and so on. But right now, what's important for me and here is what direction is that force? And I want you to work that out. Down? Actually, no, it's not. So remember, it's the right hand palm rule. So get out your right hand. Yeah. And your thumb is the direction of the particles. So. That's your positive charge to your thumb to the right. Yeah. Now you'll need to kind of have your fingers going into the page because that's the magnetic field. So kind of your fingers are into the page. Yeah. And that means which way is your hand pushing? Coming out of the page? No, it's not out of the page. It's upwards. It's upward. So that means the force on the magnetic field would be up, which means that you're going to get a force from the magnetic field being up. All right. So do you understand what I'm getting at here? If in this situation, I've got a force from the magnetic field and a force from the electric field, yeah? Yeah. One is going down and one is going up. 
So one, I mean, so, so in that situation, I mean, which way will the particle go? Will it go up or down? Uh, stay in the middle, if they are equal. Say that again? Um, if the forces are equivalent, and then... It, it Exactly, right? So, so we don't know until we know how big the forces are. And that really depends, right? Yeah. It could go down, it could go up, or, you know, or it could just go straight if the forces are equal. And indeed, what we're interested in is the situation where they are equal. That's what we're interested in. Yeah. Now, again, you don't need to know the formulas. These formulas, I'm just writing here, you know, for, I guess, you know, so you know. But... There is a situation where the forces cancel each other out, which means the particle goes straight through. And you don't need to memorize this, but it, you know, it depends on the electric field strength and the magnetic field strength. And you can calculate from formulas that you don't need to know that it's E over B. Yeah. Which means by adjusting E, which we can most definitely do, and adjusting B, which we can most also most definitely do, we can control it the velocity. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you understand that at this point in time, this is velocity, which is random a bit. Yeah. But at this point in time, we've got velocity, which is set. Yeah. Are you happy with that? Yeah. Right. Well, then, the next part is where we subject it to a magnetic field. So tell me again, if we subject a moving charged particle to a magnetic field and a magnetic field only, what's going to happen to it? Undergo circular motion. Exactly. So basically this is the deflection phase. So basically, you know, make it undergo circular motion. Yeah. So I'm going to, uh, well, you don't really care. Um, it doesn't really matter, but basically, you know, I will do that. And, and then after that, then you basically do a detector. I'll use other slides to kind of show you this. All right. Yeah. But basically it will now start undoing circular motion and it'll undergo a detector. So once you control the velocity, Let's imagine that your my particle, in my earlier example, I was going to the right. In my example, I was going, here going up. But the point is, it's going in some direction, right? So these are my particle with a set velocity, and it's going up, yeah? Yep. Are you happy with that? Yep. Now, these dots represent the magnetic field, which are out of the page. Yep. Yeah, as I said before, you don't really need to know the direction too much for chemistry because it'll always be in the right direction when it's designed for you. You just need to say some general terms like, you know, due to magnetic field deflection, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, when I'm drawing out these diagrams here, I kind of want to be true. So that's why I've kind of made everything correct. But if the velocity is going up and the magnetic field is coming out of the page, then can you use your hand to figure out which way the force is going? The force is going... To the, to, the, to the right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So now, now that you know that, then the next question is, well, if it goes to the right, then basically it will undergo circular motion. It'll kind of do this thing, right? Yeah. Now I told you it's a circle, but we don't know how big it is. So, you know, it could be a very small circle like this. It could be like the blue circle. It could be the yellow circle. It could be the red circle. Assuming they're circles, obviously, you know, I drew those flu hand. But it could be any circle. Yeah. That's all we know right now. But what we do also know from what we said before, how do we tell how big the circle is? Use the formula. You, it's, it's affected by those factors, right? It's affected by M and V and, you know, Q and B, right? Yeah. Now, do we know B? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's you know, made by a machine. We said it, right? Yeah. 
if we don't know, we could most certainly find out because it's from our machine, right? Yeah. Do we know V? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, we selected the velocity earlier, right? Yeah. So we, we know V and we know B. Now, do we know M and Q? Mm, no. Technically, no. All right? No. Yeah. But can you see that if we know V and B, then basically this V over B is a constant that we, we kind of know, right? Yeah. So can you therefore see that basically, well, the, the radius is proportional to the mass divided by the charge. Yeah. And if it's the proportional to the mass divided by the charge, then basically it's the mass to charge ratio. Does that make sense? Yeah. So therefore, the radius is simply the representing of the mass to charge ratio of whatever you're sending through. Yeah. And so what we would do is we would send in our sample. It would make it undergo circular motion. And then simplistically, we could just detect, you know, where it lands. And by knowing where it lands, we will know the R, obviously. So this is the diameter, but we would then work out the R. And then the R, because we know V and B, we would work out the mass to charge ratio. And therefore, this would be associated with a particular mass to charge ratio. This would be associated with a particular mass to charge ratio. This would be associated with a particular mass to charge ratio. Does that make sense? Yeah. Which therefore means that your mass spec has now, if you imagine your sample had a lot of different particles with different mass to charge ratios, has separated them out into the different mass to charge ratios. Yeah. So look, in the context of what you do with mass spec in your course, you're likely to be tested on it with organic chemistry. And you know, we'll talk about how to do that in a moment, right? But you know, if, for example, we had a mixture of a whole different bunch of ions, right? A whole bunch of cations, say, then by telling the mass to charge ratio, we can work out what element it is, for example. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, this is very similar, and we'll be using this sort of concept for your organic chem as well, but firstly, you need to understand this. So, idea is, wrong button. Well, I'll, I'll, so the idea is, at the end of your mass spec sort of experiment, you'll end up getting this sort of reading. You'll have a mass to charge ratio in your horizontal, and we'll look at some questions in a moment. But your horizontal axis is your mass to charge ratio. Your vertical, you know, is basically like your relative intensity. So the tallest one will always just be called, you know, the base peak and give, be given 100. But, you know, and basically it's just how many of those particles you've got respectively, relative to each other. Yep. All right. So, oops. So we'll basically need to basically talk about um, your radius equals mv over qv. And based on the radius, you then get the mass to charge ratio. And importantly, that is how you use mass spec. Yep. Now, of course, we now need to consider that was using one sort of, you know, atom. But how does mass spec spectroscopy relate to analysis of organic compounds, e.g., molecules? 